good afternoon, everyone. It's our final study, and uh, we conclude chapter 10 this afternoon as we've uh, had a really interesting journey through chapters 8, 9, and 10. Simple question should we eat meat off of the idols, Paul? And we still haven't really arrived at the final answer, but in this uh, session, Paul finally gives us the answer that we've been waiting for, and uh, he's taken a long time getting there, and for, for good reasons. So, where we're up to. <coughs> In 1 Corinthians 10, the warning to the Libertines about the dangers of idolatry, we're still in that little section there. And then the second section, which we're going to cover this afternoon as well, is some practical advice about dealing with meats offered to idols in daily life. So that is the section in which the Apostle Paul finally gives the answer that we've been waiting for. But leading up to it, we're still in this section where he's developing the issues around principle by which we should live our life. And so we're up to... <coughs> We can see here that we've talked about the example of Israel and the exhortation, the lessons to be learnt from Israel, and then the folly of exposing oneself to needless temptation. And so in that section, the Apostle Paul warned the Libertine brother to be very careful for his own spiritual well-being's sake, to say nothing of all of those within our circle of influence in the Ecclesia and our families. Then he... <clears throat> I left off before considering this, even though this would have been fantastic to consider in the memorial meeting with the bread and wine. We're going to start with this in this section... The lesson of the bread and wine, the same lesson that can be gleaned uh, from the idol sacrifices and the application of those lessons to how we should behave in reference to the idol sacrifices that, that were made in Corinth. Actually, sorry, verse 18 is the same lesson from the sacrifices under the law and then verses 19 to 22 extrapolates the lesson as they should apply in Corinth when dealing with idol sacrifices and meat offered to idols. So, that's our goal this afternoon, to get to, to the end of the chapter. So, <clears throat> verses 15 to 17, he takes the lesson of the bread and wine and he's extending his argument here beyond where he's reached so far. And he says, look, I speak unto wise men, judge what I say. And uh, what he's really saying here is that you're clever people, you're wise, you're thoughtful, You've got the reasoning capacity to understand and weigh up what, is, what I have to say. Please, listen carefully to what I have to say about this. And then he goes on and he says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The word bless here means to give thanks. It's called the cup of thanksgiving. And it's one of the cups that was used in the Passover feast. It was the third cup, actually, of the Passover feast, which was called the cup of thanksgiving. Each cup in the Passover feast that the Jews held was given its own name. The third cup was called the cup of thanksgiving. And it's probably that cup in the upper room, the third cup of the feast which, with which Jesus instituted the memorial feast, which we kept together this morning. <clears throat> so it's actually the name given to a cup, a cup of thanksgiving, which we give thanks for, and we did that this morning, the NIV says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? <clears throat> now we understand that communion, as has been translated there in the King James Version, means participation or fellowship. It's what the Greek word means. This, this uh, communion or sharing is fellowship. The bread which we break, is it not the fellowship of the body of Christ? So it's a very intimate sharing of something so important to us. For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers or sharers in that one bread. So that feast that we keep on Sunday mornings that we kept this morning where we share the bread and the wine, it, it brings us all together as one. It's a very intimate thing, that feast. It's a meal of intimate fellowship. It's probably the most intimate spiritual experience that we share together, the bread and the wine, without question. And so why is he saying this? So there's the word communion, which means partnership, participation, fellowship. So what, what's, why is he raising this in the context of what he's trying to get at? Well, our weekly religious memorial meal of ritual is the most intimate spiritual experience we have. There is nothing that symbolically represents our absolute spiritual unity with Christ and with each other more than the memorial meal we share. Now this is the point. 
and you Corinthians are going and sharing just such a meal in the idol temple. What do you think those people in that idol temple are thinking about you joining in in their intimate meal of fellowship, in worship to that idol? <clears throat> and really what he's raising is this. How does your conduct in going in and joining them in that meal, how do they view that? And so he's taking it up another level here. <clears throat> he started in chapter 8 by saying, think of your brothers and sisters and their spiritual well-being in making a decision. <clears throat> then later on in chapter 9 and into chapter 10, the first half of chapter 10, he says, think about your own spiritual well-being and those perhaps within your immediate sphere of influence. And then now he's saying... <clears throat> When you go into the idol temple and sit at meat in the idol temple, what are they thinking as they look at you, a Christadelphian, sharing the intimate meal of fellowship which they share with their God? <clears throat> and then he goes on, he says, let's look at the sacrifices under the law. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of that altar? And, of course, they which eat of the sacrifices are the priests, and we've already looked at that already in the context that Paul referred to it earlier, the Levites and the offerer themselves who, in the case of a, of a, a peace offering, would share in that meal. And so it was a meal of fellowship, a fellowship offering. A peace offering was a fellowship offering. And it would bring all of those people, all of those parties, around the table to share in a meal at God's family table. And that's really what this morning's feast is about with the bread and the wine. We are pulling up a chair with the Lord and his Father God at the same table and we are sharing in, in a family meal together, a very intimate family meal of fellowship. And so it happened that uh, under the law, the offer and the priest got to eat some of the peace offering. It was a very symbolic intimate intimate fellowship uh, meal between God and the offerer. <clears throat> Effectively, they were sharing a meal with Almighty God in, in his temple. And so, what are the implications of this? And so Paul says, what say I then? What, what am I getting at? I've sort of already explained what he's getting at, but what he says is this, that the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to the idols is anything? So this is a rhetorical question. Am I saying that with you going into the idol temple and sharing in their intimate meal of fellowship, that I'm saying that there is really an idol in there and that those worshippers really are worshipping something that truly exists um, and that that God is in any way powerful and that the meat offered to the God is, is somehow ritually changed or ceremonially changed by it or it's more holy? Or What am I saying? This is a rhetorical question. Paul feels that it's unnecessary to answer it. The answer is obvious. Of course I'm not saying that you are actually having intimate fellowship with a non-existent God because it's impossible to have intimate fellowship with a non-existent God. What am I saying then? If I'm not saying that, what am I saying? But, says Paul, this is what I do say, that the things with which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Now this word devils is uh, not diabolos, it's daimonian, it's demons. It refers to a demonic being or a deity in the, in the spirit world, if you like, a spiritual being that the, the Gentiles believed was the reality that was symbolised by that statue in that temple. So they didn't actually believe the statue had any power to do anything. The statue was itself a representation of a greater deity, whatever that deity was and wherever that deity existed, whether it be in heaven or in the underworld or whatever, wherever it was. So what he's saying is, in the pagan's eyes, they are fellowshipping demons. And as you join them in that place and for that meal, in their eyes, 
So are you. They are looking at you saying, oh, he's with us or she's with us. She agrees with us. He is having fellowship with our God, our lifestyle, our way of life. We are having intimate spiritual fellowship around our get-together with Aphrodite. Isn't it lovely how we can all be together? What's the principle that Paul is drawing out here? The principle is that in any decisions that we make, other people's perceptions do matter. I mean, you might take the view that oh, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care if they think I am having fellowship with the devils. Of course I'm not. I don't even believe the devils exist. How can I have fellowship with non-existent devils? Paul's saying that, that's only one part of what's going on here. It's not just about what you think. As you share that meal with them, it matters what they think. You should be thinking, what are they thinking? How are they seeing this? How are they interpreting this? So other people's perceptions do matter and do need to be taken into account when making decisions about our behaviour. Whether that person is another brother or sister, for example, the brother or sister with a weak conscience in our meeting, chapter 8, or here in chapter 10, a pagan person in the world who's looking on. Your behaviour can either help or hinder the gospel. Have you ever had the experience where you're speaking to someone at work or in, in the shopping centre or whatever um, and you don't really have the opportunity to share with them the, your faith and then one day they turn up here at Cumberland Hall to attend a lecture and they bump into you and they look at you and say, are you a Christadelphian? I didn't know you were a Christadelphian. I never thought for a second you were a Christadelphian. How embarrassing would that be? So we don't know the future of the people with whom we're interacting at work or our neighbours or uh, in the shopping centres. We don't know whether God is calling them and whether they yet will be our brothers and sisters. The way we behave in their company matters a lot. Not just how we behave but how we're perceived to be behaving. Because we can either help or hinder the gospel in the way that we conduct ourselves in their midst and that matters. It matters to God. And so he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord. You can't come along on Sunday morning and drink the cup of the Lord and, and share the bread and the wine and share the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. In other words, don't rationalise it away any longer. He's not saying it's physically impossible to be there on Saturday night and here on Sunday morning. But if you want to be consistent in your life, it's impossible. So don't rationalise it away. You can't rationalise it away on the grounds that you're strong enough because we've already found out that we may not be and it's too late to find out the hard way. We don't want to find out that way, that we're not strong enough and that we fall into sin because of the temptations that are presented to us there in that location or in that place that we go to. <clears throat> and we can't rationalise it away any longer because oh, it doesn't matter what they think, they're just pagans. So I'm going along, I don't care what they think really, I'm just, I'm just going along to enjoy the nice restaurant meal that they've got there. And the, and the, meal, and the, and the best, they, they save the best meat for the idol, well I want to taste that. It can't be done, he's saying. You need to make a choice. You need to make sure your allegiances are clear and then you need to live by those allegiances for all to see. What's your objective, says Paul, in attending the memorial meeting on Sunday morning and then getting involved in all this worldly stuff out there in the idol temple on another evening in the week? What, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Is that what you're trying to do? Are we stronger than he? Do you think that it's a good idea to provoke Almighty God to jealousy? God is a jealous God. There's nothing clearer than that from the Bible. God's jealous about his associations, his love for us and our, our dedication to him. God is jealous. He, will, he won't share us with any, anything. He's not prepared to. It's not okay to have a foot in both camps. In fact, the commandments... <clears throat> make it very clear. C commandment uh, numbers one and two. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have 
no other gods beside me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. This is, this is where Paul is referring. He's referring to this, these first two commandments where God sets down absolutely his hatred of idolatry and his jealousy for, our, for us and our love and our allegiance to him. I show mercy unto thousands and them that love me and keep my commandments. So God is a jealous God. He will not share us with anyone. He's not prepared to. So if we think we're going to have a bet each way, we're only kidding ourselves. Now Moses had to tell the, the, the wilderness generation this many, many times. And one of the occasions where he really spelt it out was right at the end of his life. In fact, Moses said at the end of his life in Deuteronomy, towards the end of the book, he said, I've got bad news. I know that you're going to fail in this area. I know that you're going to be taken away, or your children are, by your association with the nations around and their idols. I know. And he did that, he said that to them in Deuteronomy 32. And it's very interesting that all through 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul is weaving the words and the warnings of Moses to that generation that he'd referred us to in the early verses of chapter 10 for their five blessings and then their five big mistakes. He just weaves through the warnings of Moses through this whole chapter. For instance, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Deuteronomy 32, Oh, that ye were wise, that you would understand this, said Moses. Please understand what I'm trying to warn you about. Verse 4, That spiritual rock that followed them, 1 Corinthians 10, of that rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful. Deuteronomy 32. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 10, They sacrifice unto devils, not to God. Deuteronomy 32, 17. They sacrifice to devils, not to God. Direct quotation. 1 Corinthians 10. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. <coughs> verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 10. Are we stronger than he? Verse Deuteronomy 32. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 10. The cup of devils. And verses 32 and 33. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom, venom of asps. So you can see the weaving of the warning of Moses through this section in chapter 10 where we're trying to get to the heart of this matter as far as idolatry and uh, uh, our interaction with it in our daily lives. So that brings us to the last section of 1 Corinthians 10 where the Apostle now moves on to some practical advice. So the Corinthians are still saying, or thinking at least, Paul... Can you just tell me what I should do in my daily life? Well, Paul, Paul has taken all this time to get there, but he's going to uh, outline some helpful advice here for them. Now, the first part of this is the selfless principle in verses 23 to 24. Then he's going to give some practical advice on buying meat in verses 27 to 30. Uh, sorry, 25 and 26. Then he's going to give some practical advice on sharing meats, which is a slightly different scenario, in verses 27 to 30. And then he's going to outline to them the God-centred principle. And then he's going to talk about a further reiteration of the selfless principle, which will bring us to the end of the chapter. So he's sort of winding up now, and he's bringing it all together. Now in verse 23, we'll just read that verse. Ah, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. You'll notice the repetition there. It's a repetition of something that, that occurred um, earlier in this book as well, in chapter 6. You just might just turn back a couple of pages and see 6 verse 12. In another context, in the context of sexual immorality here in chapter 6, one of the arguments of the Corinthian libertine was that all things are lawful unto me. That's a little catchphrase that the libertine used to keep repeating ad infinitum and rather annoyingly all things are lawful unto me they used to take advantage of the fact that the apostle Paul teached, taught freedom from the law of Moses that we're free from the shackles of the law of Moses now that played right into the hands of the Corinthian libertine who said all things are lawful for me show me a verse which says I can't do it 
uh, show me a verse. You know, all things are lawful unto me. But, but he quotes that, but then he says, but all things are not expedient or profitable or constructive. It's not a matter of what you can get away with, whether, whether I can't find a verse that says I definitely can't do it. It's not the question whether it's lawful. The question is, is it constructive? Does it add to the great purpose of your life? Does it do something towards the building of spiritual, spirituality in your life and in your mind? And then he quotes it again. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, in this particular context, he's talking about addictions. You see, it may be lawful, but it, you could be brought under the power of it. You know, you're claiming liberty. You're claiming freedom to do anything you like. But actually, if you claim freedom to do whatever you like only to get addicted to some behaviour or some substance because you're free to use it or free to do it, if you become addicted, you're not free at all. You're less free than you ever have been because you're a slave to your new, new addiction. And in this case, he was talking about uh, addictions to sexual immorality or anything else for that matter. If we, if we argue that we're free to do it and then become addicted to sin, you're not free at all in any, in, in, in any sense that matters. You're actually enslaved to the very things we're trying to escape from. You see, that's what's ironic about the Israelites complaining that, that there were much better food in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. They're slaves. Do you want to be a slave again? You're free. Flee idolatry. They fled Egypt with every enthusiasm to flee from slavery and now they wanted to go back to enslave themselves again. So this uh, little catchphrase comes up here in chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful to me, or for me, says the uh, Corinthian Libertine, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So to put it in a table, all things are lawful for me is the libertine catch cry, which we've just looked at in 1 Corinthians 6. But all things are not expedient. That is, they don't contribute positively to the aim of the work that we're engaged in. That's, that's really the test. Not whether it's lawful, not whether it's permissible, but whether it's contributing positively to what we're doing here. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not or edify not. You'll notice he doesn't talk about enslavement here, but he, he talks about whether it's constructive. And then he moves on in verse 24 to enunciate what I've called the selfless principle. It should be one of the guiding beacons of our lives. It's really a summary of chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10. <laughs> Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. That has got to be one of the mantras of our lives. It's the selfless principle. It's the principle by which we put the needs of others first. We, th we think about our brother or sister with a weak conscience before we act. We think about what the pagan person out there who might one day become interested in the truth thinks about us sitting there in that fellowship meal with the idol. We think about what the, how they might be thinking and then we make a decision on the basis of what's best for them, these other people in our lives. Now for us, that might be our children as well or our wife or our non-Christadelphian relatives, for example, or whoever it is within our sphere of influence that we might influence for good towards the gospel message. Let no man seek his own but every man another's. So don't argue about uh, your rights or that you, you, you know, you've got the liberty to do this and who are you to tell me what to do. It's an entirely wrong attitude. And then he moves on to consider two scenarios to help the Corinthians actually apply all the principles that he's enunciated in these chapters. Scenario one is in verses 25 and 26. Let's read those verses. He says, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, which just means the meat markets in Corinth, where you could buy a mixture of meat, including ordinary meat and sacred meat that have been offered to the idols, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And that's a quote from Psalm 24, verse 1. So here's scenario one. You buy meat 
in your day, you know, weekly shopping, you don't know where it's from. What should you do? Should you make inquiries of the shopkeeper and say, where's this meat been? Has this been up to the idol temple? Has it been offered to the idols? Has it been near that at all? And start making interrogations as to the origin of this meat. What Paul says is, buy the meat, eat it, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the sake of your conscience. Because once it's revealed to you where it has come from, then you've got to make additional decisions. But if you're just going for your shopping, buy the meat, take it home, eat it, ask no questions. Practical advice. The scriptural grounds for his advice in this matter is Psalm 24 verse 1, which says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God, really. All lambs, all sheep, everything that you could possibly have on the earth, it all is God's anyway. Eat it, give thanks for it to God, to whom it belongs. The idol's nothing. The idol doesn't really exist. It doesn't belong to the idol. Even if it was offered to the idol, don't worry about it too much because it belongs to God. He is the one God, the origin of all things, the father of all. Just eat it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Give thanks to God for it. That's his advice. Then, in verses 27 to 28, we've got another scenario portrayed for us. If any of them that believe not, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, hmm, that meat there, that was offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not. For his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So you, you, you've been bidden to a feast, you are disposed to go, which means that the circumstances are that you've chosen it's best to go to this feast. You've, the people at the feast are non-believers, non non-Christadelphians if you like. So that might be your family. Uh, who haven't come into the truth yet or people at work in your workplace and you, you get invited to a, a meal and you feel obliged to go and you feel it's the right thing to go. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily at all. Uh, in fact, it might be advisable to go in, in many circumstances. What should you do? When your friends or family at that feast inform you that that meat is from the idol temple. Now, they're not going to do so without a reason, usually like, oh, you're a Christian, oh, that meat there, that's been offered at the idol temple. And they, they look at you with a twinkle in their eye thinking, what's he going to do now? Recommendation of Paul? Don't eat it, for conscience sake. This, so for the same reason, for conscience sake, don't eat it. The scriptural grounds for not eating it? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Hang on a sec, that's the same quote that he used to establish the fact that we should eat it in the other scenario. So the same quote is used to prove on the one hand that we should eat it in one case and in this case we shouldn't eat it, Psalm 24 verse 1. How can Paul use the same quotation from Psalm 24 verse 1 to justify exactly the opposite course of action? Well, in the first case, his, his emphasis on, is, is here. Don't, oh, sorry, eat it, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth and the fullness thereof, everything belongs to God. Everything. Every sort of meat, everything belongs to God, including the meat offered to idols. In case two, there's a different thing at stake. Because here, it's important to underline that the earth is the Lord's and not the idol's. The earth is the Lord's and you are making the point to those that pointed out to you that it's offered to idols that the earth belongs to God and not to the idol. 
And so what uh, Paul does in Psalm 24 verse 1 to justify the opposite course of action using the same quotation, he does so to establish beyond doubt that there is no inconsistency or contradiction of principle because you're doing one thing and another in, in a different circumstance. What may be wise in one context and situation may not be wise in another context and situation. And this is where you need to make wise decisions about the way you apply principle in your daily life. And this is what Paul's been trying to get at throughout these three chapters, that there is not just one answer to all these questions, but we need to think about it and apply the principles for whose benefit? Do I choose not to eat it for my sake? Where it says don't, uh, don't eat it for conscience sake, does it, does, it, does it mean my conscience? Well, look at verse 29. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. That's important. You're choosing to, act, to make a decision not because your conscience says you shouldn't eat meats off the wattles, but you're thinking of their conscience. You're thinking of them. And this is so important in this scenario. For whose benefit? For his sake that showed it. Now in this case it's an outsider. And in verse, verse 29, and for conscience sake not thine own but the other. So, so let's just go back there. Sorry, let, let's just make this clear. In verse 28 it says, Eat not for his sake that showed it. So in that case, you're choosing not to eat because that person pointed it out and you're, you're choosing not to eat to make a point to them. But then he says in verse 29, Conscience I say not thy own but of the other, I believe here it could include also the weak brother who is walking past at this point and looking at you and your behaviour and drawing conclusions about that. You remember in chapter 8, the conclusion saw thee which sat at meat in the idol's temple and his conscience was emboldened to eat those things offered to idols and because it was an issue for his conscience, he, it, it led to his spiritual ruin. And so when we're making decisions, it might be for an outsider or for a brother or sister in the ecclesia with a weak conscience, for either. And of course we are considering the selfless principle in doing all these things. What is the selfless principle again? Verse 24, let no man seek his own, but every man another's good. Something else worthy of note Psalm 24, verse 1. Now, you, the picture of Corinth that I've, I've had on the screen the whole weekend has been of the main street of Corinth with that huge mountain and people climbing up that mountain to get to the idol temple. You may want to just quickly look at Psalm 24, verse, verse 1 to see the masterful exposition of the Apostle Paul in the context of 1 Corinthians. You see in Psalm 24 verse 1 there, the earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof. The world and all they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Read on. Who shall ascend into the hill of Yahweh? Or who shall stand in his, his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. You see, it's about which hill are we climbing, isn't it? Which hill in our lives are we climbing? Are we climbing, Corinthians, that hill up to the place where all our lusts can be fulfilled, all our carnal desires can be satisfied? Or are we climbing the hill of Yahweh in our lives? And keeping ourselves pure from those things. Keeping ourselves separate. That's the hill we're climbing. And for the Corinthians, that's where they should be putting all their attention. Well, in the next verse, coming back to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, 
uh, verses. Uh, actually, I'll just mention verse 29 again. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged or condemned of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I gave thanks? That last section of verse 29 and 30, is not, the meaning is not clearly apparent in the King James Version. But what he's basically saying is this. Make a wise decision. Don't eat it for his sake that showed it and for the other person's conscience. For why should you be judged or condemned by someone else? For, okay, you might be happy to eat it and you might think it's fine, but it would be a pity if that led to someone else condemning your conduct even though you don't believe it to be fundamental. And so you're thinking of the way they would react and, and judge you and your behaviour, even though they're misreading it. You need to make the decision for their sakes who have seen it so that they don't wrongly judge you and draw conclusions about you and your conduct. So you're thinking of the way they are judging you in that conduct. And that's what the end of verses 29 and 30 is saying. Because, look, you, you could give thanks for it. You could be sincerely thankful for that meat and just eat it. But then in doing so, you're causing them to condemn you because they thought you stood for something else. And so, verse 31, and this should say verse 31 up the top of the slide here, we reach the God-centred principle. And here's the God-centred principle. So, whether therefore you eat, or whether you drink, or whatsoever you do, now that's an important little phrase. This doesn't just apply to eating or drinking meats offered to idols. This principle that I've been expounding, I've spent three chapters outlining for you, what, this applies to every aspect of your life. Whatever it is that you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, which is our theme for the weekend. He's brought us to this point where he's emphasised not only our need to be selfless in the decisions we make and think of other people, whether they be our brothers and sisters or even those outside who are observing our conduct. Here, we need to think above all in whatever we do, are we bringing glory to the name of our God? That's really what it comes down to. That everything we do reflects on God. Every decision we make, every conversation we have, reflects upon our God. And so it's, it, it causes us to reflect on our actions, doesn't it? And the Apostle Paul said, I don't want to do anything to hinder the extension of the gospel of God. And so he says... In verse 32, where does this lead us? How does this principle, this God-centred principle, lead us to act? Well, this is how I live my life, giving no offence, no cause for stumbling. I don't make any decisions which I knowingly, in which I would knowingly cause another to stumble. Neither to the Jews, I become all things to the Jews, to the Jews I become as a Jew. To the Gentiles... To those that are without law as without law, not without law to God but under law to Christ, he said in, in chapter 9, nor to the ecclesia of God. I don't, so I think of the Jews, I think of the Gentiles who are not yet converted, the pagans, those in the synagogue, and I think of the effect of my actions upon the ecclesia of God. Everything I do. And then in verse 33, there's a further, ex, uh, further expression of the selfless principle. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. You see, it brings it back to our goal of saving our brothers and sisters. Christ was brought into the world and he lived his life and he died the death he did that he might save sinners. We, our work 
in the ecclesia and the extension of his. We are here to save people, not to cause them offence, to cause them to stumble, to cause them to walk away because of our actions from the truth. How tragic that would be. That's exactly the opposite outcome that we want. So in whatever we do, we want to save people. That's our objective, and that was Paul's objective. I'm not here to please me. I'm here to get people to the kingdom of God. And that's how I live my life. And then chapter 11, verse 1, belongs in chapter 10. It finishes off this section. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Because I didn't, this is not a principle that started with me. In, in this selfless principle, I am following the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the grand principle of his life, where Christ died for us. Even that weak brother, said Paul, for whom Christ died. And in the parallel section in Romans 15, uh, the same phrase occurs in verse 3, for even Christ, Paul says, pleased not himself. Even Christ pleased not himself. So the question is, who do we follow in life? Who, who do we follow? There's a very interesting thing that I came across when I was, uh, had the opportunity to visit Corinth and others have been there before me and pointed this out, that archaeologists have found shoes like this one in Corinth. And this shoe has on it, on the, on the sole of it, it looks a bit weird up there, you can't really tell, it's an artist's impression, that is the bottom. You are looking at the sole of a shoe. And that Greek word there means follow me. And these shoes were worn by the prostitutes in Corinth. And the impression was left in the sand on the road. And you would know where to go to follow them. And so the question is for us, who do we follow? Who are we following? Who's footsteps are we following? And for the Corinthian, as they were going into that idol temple, whose footsteps were they following into that location? And where, would, where should they rather have been? So I suppose the big question for us as, as we leave here is, uh, do we have any issues like this one? I mean, it started off very simply, didn't it? Didn't it? Should we eat meat offered to idols or not, Paul? Three chapters later, they wouldn't have seen that coming. But of course, it's a, it's a prototype in a way. He's, he's setting it up here as, as, a, as a model for us to, to follow in whatever issues confront us in, in the Cumberland Ecclesia or in any ecclesia as we journey towards the kingdom together to try to see things in a different light as we maybe see things differently. We've got, we've got to take all these issues into account as we work through these issues. So I just, I just wrote down a whole list of things you know, that, that might cause arguments and have caused arguments and still might cause arguments. Petty little things that people have discussed, some petty, some not possibly. Should we do these things in ecclesial life? And on what basis should we make decisions about that? Should you do them in your family? You know? Should we go to nightclubs? Should we hang pictures on your wall of movie stars? What hobbies are okay to have? You know, should we sacrifice time with family for more money? I hesitate to put all these things up here because you might draw conclusions about what, my, what some of my views might be. It's not. It's just I'm just putting a whole heap of issues up here, some ridiculously simple and non-issues, some perhaps not. But how do we make decisions on issues like these? How do we answer these questions about whether we should do something or not in our personal lives, in our family lives and as, a, as an ecclesia? Well, what the Apostle has revealed to us is that there are two absolute, immovable, incontrovertible truths that must form the basis of any discussions that we have around these things. And the first is the selfless principle. 
in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, like, let no man seek his own, but every man another's well-being. And the second one is, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, the God-centred principle, do all to the glory of God. These are the two great principles that he's just explained to us. And my question to you is, do they remind you of anything? You can answer that question if you like. Do they remind you of anything, these two great principles? Two great commandments, said the Lord, are love your neighbour as yourself and love God with all your heart, your soul and your mind. They're the two grand principles of our lives. It's no surprise that Paul has drawn us through chapter 8, chapter 9 and chapter 10 until we arrive at this point <coughs> where even if your neighbour is not watching and so your neighbour can't make judgments of you, God is. So love God and don't disappoint him in every decision you make in your life, personal or ecclesial, and love your neighbour. Wherever what you do affects your neighbour, love your neighbour. Both of these two grand principles, said the Lord, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything is encompassed in these two ideas. And so we've got a hierarchy of priorities. God first. Others second, self last. Now, they're listed in the reverse order to what the Lord listed them. The Lord said the most important commandment is to love God and the second is to love your neighbour. When Paul iterates them here, he first iterates the selfless principle and then he names the God-centred principle. And uh, you, I just asked myself the question, why would he have addressed that in that order? He's not necessarily rever uh, reverting their priority, but what he's saying is that the second commandment possibly is the one being neglected the most by the Corinthians in the way that they were behaving towards each other. Now, when they were neglecting the second commandment, they were neglecting this great principle which is presented to us in 1 Corinthians 13 as the antidote to the Corinthian problem. The antidote to selfishness is to seek after love. Of course, love is the basis of both those two great commandments, to love God, put him first before me, and to love your neighbour, to put my neighbour first before me. Now, I've already mentioned, and don't even try to read that, but I've just done a little bit of an analysis of all the occurrences in the chapters leading up to chapter 13 of the ideas and the words and the expressions that occur in chapter 13. Because all through 1 Corinthians 1 through to chapter 10 that we've just done here, it's the language of 1 Corinthians 13 is embedded. Because that's where he's leading. He's leading the Corinthians inexorably to what he's got to say in chapter 13. And so when we have a look at chapter 13... I've just done this little paraphrase of what he says there about how we should conduct ourselves in occlusion life and behave ourselves towards each other. And he calls it the more excellent way. What, a, what an amazing ecclesia we would have if we all lived by the principles of this more excellent way. It would be, without question, a taste of the kingdom. Now, of course... <coughs> We all fall short in these areas. Not one of us gets it perfect, gets it right all the time. We, we say things we regret. Uh, we humiliate people at times in ways that we don't intend to. We f show favouritism to people, maybe to family or to close friends, when we, we don't really intend to. There's all kinds of ways in which we could fall short of showing the kind of love that we really need to, to our brothers and sisters. And by the way, the more we appreciate one another, the more love becomes natural and I suspect the more difficult times become in our lives the more we appreciate one another and I get a strong sense here at the Cumberland Ecclesia that there's a lot of people going through great trials and, and difficulties and I get the strong sense that you really do appreciate each other because of the difficulties that you're facing here and there are many of them 
Uh, it will make you stronger, I have no doubt, if it has not already. Uh, that's not to say that these problems are easy to deal with, but you know, they make our love stronger. Uh, love perseveres patiently and is kind and gracious, is not envious of others, does not boast or brag, and is not swollen with pride. Love does not behave shamefully towards another, is not selfish, is not roused to irritation or anger, does not tally the evil received from others, but uh, does not rejoice to hear of another's iniquities, but rejoices with the truth. <coughs> Love discreetly covers the imperfections of others, believes the best of all others, hopes for the best for all others, patiently endures all wrong received from others. Love never fails or fades. That's the antidote, is it not, to the Corinthian problem. Love leads us to these attitudes of the way we should communicate with each other, the way we should consider our example and its effect upon others, that giving is better than receiving, that sacrificing is one of the greatest joys in life, even if it involves pain, that showing empathy is one of the greatest and most mature things you can do in your relationships with another. Empathy means to try to see things through their eyes, to stand in their shoes and to walk a mile in their shoes to understand the way they feel about a particular matter and why, they might, why that weak brother with that sensitive conscience might be seeing things that way and how my rather gruff conduct and, and way of communicating about this issue might affect them and their attitude to faith and to God. To show patience with people who aren't quite there yet and maybe are at a different stage in the journey to, uh, to, to appropriate the full righteousness of God. You know, we're all at different points on that journey. Let's not forget where we were maybe 20 or 30 years ago, if we're that old. But just realise that we're all at different places. To show consideration for others. To understand con conscience and the importance of developing conscience in, in ourselves and, and in others and allowing their conscience to find expression in the things that they do as they worship and, and daily obey their God at the level they're at in their understanding. <coughs> to show sensitivity to the needs of others and to show humility. Now, of course, we understand that the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's what it is. As we grow to show forth God in our lives, love is at the centre. Now, unfortunately, the way these libertines were behaving, love was almost entirely absent. And so how could they possibly show the fruit of the Spirit in their lives? They thought they were going to win the argument and get their way, but that was got nothing to do with developing the fruit of the Spirit, which is the real objective of why we're all here. And by the way, fruit takes time to develop. It can take decades, really, for trees to mature and bring forth really good fruit. And, the, and the, the fruit of the Spirit is these kinds of things. Gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control, goodness, long-suffering, peace. We're people who make peace and joy. These are the kinds of people that we should be and these are the kinds of people that the Apostle Paul wanted the Corinthians to become. Well, that's our study <laughs> and uh, it's an amazing uh, three chapters. I hope you found it helpful. If we can see the points that Paul is trying to make in these epistles, I've got absolutely no doubt if everyone in Cumberland could put these principles into practice, uh, what a power of strength it would be for all of us to come along to the Cumberland Ecclesia every Sunday and feel totally welcome, feeling totally encouraged and going away each Sunday strengthened for the week ahead. And that's how it should be. But it, of course, it requires all of us to put these things into practice. Hopefully it won't be too long before we'll see the Lord uh, in the earth again and we'll all be joined with our, with our Corinthian brothers and sisters uh, at the feet of our Lord. 
Uh, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of Priscilla and myself for being so hospitable. We've really enjoyed our time together, catching up with old friends and, and meeting some uh, new people that have more recently been baptised into the Ecclesia here. Uh, it's been uh, a real inspiration to be among you and we wish you God's blessing as we all try to live by these two grand principles in our lives, the selfless principle and the God-centred principle. Uh, let no man seek his own but every man another's. And whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.